Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to this Fusion 21 uh, Wembu, uh, members webinar. Get my teeth back in. Um, hopefully you are all well. I know that these are really troubling times uh, and the strange new world uh, in which we're now all um, being forced into. But anyway, it's great uh, that we have you uh, with us uh, this morning. Uh, my name's Andrew Gray. I'm Member Relations Manager at, uh, at Fusion 21, and I'm delighted that we've got uh, with us an excellent uh, panel. Uh, so we have uh, Rebecca Reese. Say hello, Rebecca. Hello. And uh, then John Wallace, Procurement Director, Metropolitan Thames Valley. Say hello, John. Uh, hello. And then we have Nick uh, Verberg, Procurement and Supply Chain Manager at Fusion 21. So hello, Nick. Good morning, everyone. So as I said, uh, welcome uh, to today's uh, session. I, on, the, on the screen uh, in front of you should be uh, the list of questions stroke topics that the panel uh, are going to cover. Uh, what we're going to do is we'll ask each of the panelists to uh, have a brief sort of introduction in terms of their views on uh, on the topics. Um, but we very much want you, uh, the audience, to hear from you. Now, you are all on mute, so don't worry if the dog's barking or the child comes uh, charging in uh, at any particular time. Um, we've also said the same to the panelists for that matter, but and if it does happen, well, so be it that's uh, that's life as we uh, as we know uh, at the moment but we do want you uh, to type uh, your questions uh, they sh you should see on the right hand side of your screen uh, in the panel uh, a list of questions and hello to Gemma Wheatley she's already said hello so we say hello back uh, to Gemma so please uh, type your questions uh, as we as we go along We'll try and answer uh, them all, um, but if we aren't able to, uh, we, we may get back to the panel and, and see if they can uh, answer uh, the questions uh, separately. Um, but anyway, so let's, uh, let, 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 let's get on. And um, uh, so, Rebecca, the coronavirus is clearly having uh, a major impact uh, on us all, but as, but as far as, uh, procurement uh, is concerned what's your sort of current view of of its impacts both in terms of the the short term but but there may be some of the longer term implications um there's so much to say on this subject i think in the short term um everybody should be keeping their eyes out on the cabinet office website for all the um procurement policy notes that are coming out that obviously directly impact on on procurement officers um, lives and how they um, undertake uh, their their day-to-day -day role um, we are seeing from other clients that no key decisions are being made um, until after we're all out of isolation so we've seen a number of um, contract procedure communications going out um, because um, clients cannot meet face-to-face -face and observe governance um, formalities. Ooh, that wasn't me. Um, that uh, uh, that procurement decisions and author authorizations are being delayed. But in terms of day-to-day -day work, most of my clients are carrying on regardless because procurement is one of those disciplines that can be um, undertaken on a remote working basis. So uh, I think most of my clients are uh, um, busier now that their internal clients have space to make those decisions so a lot of people are pressing buttons on procurement uh, that have otherwise been in the pipeline john from 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 your from your perspective uh, yeah i think we're in a slightly different position we're obviously keeping an eye on <coughs> the the cabinet office and the, the, obviously the note came through yesterday regarding supplier relief so we're, we're keeping an eye on that i think on a uh, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's very much uh, all hands to the pump. So we've uh, we've been in touch with all our all our suppliers, all two and a half thousand of them, so to speak, to just understand where they are. We collate that information. The feedback we get, we circulate 
to our senior leadership team for onward cascading. Um, we very much uh, are uh, relying on the contract managers within the business directorates to work closely with the supply base and, and if they need any assistance from us, uh, any help from us, we, we will facilitate that. Uh, certain category team members are uh, obviously trying to, to uh, make arrangements for cleaning and deep cleans and PPE. So re really sort of practical um, activities. Um, in terms of uh, ongoing procurements, most of the uh, directorates that we have are very much involved in <coughs> managing the day to day. So a lot of things, um, which I think we might be slightly different to what to Rebecca was saying, are really just uh, we're just going through a bit of a lull at the moment. Um, that lull is allowing the category managers in the team to start thinking and using that time that they wouldn't normally have to think about their plans for the you know more detail to their plans that they've got already for the next financial year. Uh, thinking a bit more, uh, yeah, spending a bit of time thinking, if you like. Um, I think in the medium to long term, um, I think this, um, the coronavirus is going to lead to a greater need for procurement. Uh, I think procurement will uh, come to the fore uh, as a result of this unfortunate uh, situation, in so much that businesses will be looking to cut costs, to trim costs, to make sure they're in a very sound financial position when it uh, when things start moving again uh, and that's going to be a long time so it, I don't hate to use the word recession but it feels like we're going into recession and, and of course procurement always uh, comes to the fore when when that is a situation yeah that, I, I fully 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 understand uh, that uh, Nick from from a, your perspective and or fusion 21 perspective yeah sure so it, it's certainly slowing procurement down and will certainly slow down even further given the changes that were implemented last night. For the Fusion 21, we've got our £80 million national lifts framework out for tender at the moment. That was due to be returned next Monday, but we've now pushed that back for a couple of weeks and we'll continue to keep an eye on developments. But we do appreciate that suppliers will have different challenges right now, but equally, equally we don't want everything to stop. And hopefully by pushing this back, it'll, it'll still allow the supply chain an opportunity to navigate through their own risk management activity and still have time to focus on future opportunities as well such as this new framework that when things do settle this can provide them with a viable business opportunity in the future and there is naturally a huge concern around the stability of the supply chain at the moment and we've got many many suppliers who who do a really good job now and you know we'll be able to do a really good job in the future as well when this is all over and it would be Certainly a travesty if we lost some of those suppliers through insolvency during this interim period. And as Rebecca said, the, the government have been issuing PPNs. There was there was one over the last day or two in terms of the continued payments of high-risk suppliers until the end of June, even if the works are suspended. So hopefully that could mitigate that risk. Longer term, I mean, what what we're seeing, and I, certainly I've seen, is is a sense of togetherness and. You know, I think platforms like LinkedIn, I've seen a lot of people asking for advice. I've seen a lot of people giving advice, working together and creating opportunities for virtual networking. So so maybe this whole pandemic will allow us to create some future changes in, in how we do work together and be more proactive in using different forms of communication to engage with each other. You know, but ultimately, the, the full scale of the impact is, is difficult to predict right now. I just hope that the measures being implemented by governments and across organisations will, will mitigate the risk of supplier failure at least. Okay, um, I, I've had a question from uh, Adrian uh, Moody. Um, is, is force majeure increasingly applicable to contract ma management measures? Rebecca, do you want to? Um, it, it could be. Adrian, hello. Um, I, it, it, it will depend on the contract drafting, and I know that's a lawyer's answer, but um, at the moment, there's lots of different contracts going around. People are arguing force majeure, and it will depend on each contractor's uh, and each contract's uh, um, particular circumstances. But we are seeing a lot of people arguing force majeure or frustration. Actually, a lot of suppliers don't want to you know, get out of their contracts, they just want to apply for relief events where the um, underlying contractual position is preserved at the moment. 
Okay, thanks. I, I don't know, John or, or, or Nick, if you sort of come across this yet in, in, in terms of uh, uh, enforcing those um, or, or those measures within the contract? Well, yeah, we, uh, yeah, so it's John. We, we've had one or two um, discussions about it, one particular um, one particular discussion with a with a supplier, not a contract with a supplier around uh, force majeure. I mean, I think our view is we is you know we want to be sympathetic. We don't necessarily we don't want to use uh, have to use force majeure. We don't want our suppliers to use force majeure. We want to find a you know a, a, a way that we can work together to get through this difficult period. So uh, it feels a bit a bit harsh and a bit ingenuous to to start trying to use those clauses. Um, I'd rather, yeah, we'd rather work collaboratively with our with our suppliers to work away, find a way through. Yeah. Nick, anything to add? No, I can only reiterate, Andrew. Really, I think it's it's one of those that is being looked at on a case by case basis. Very much depends on the terms of the the individual contracts. I know um, Travers and Hammonds have actually released some guidance or thoughts on force majeure at this point over the last few days. So. I think that gives a, a good position in, in, in terms of guidance, but it, it is being looked at on a case by case basis. But, it, you know, it's something that we anticipate increasingly will, will come up in the conversation. OK, thanks. Well, um, I'm going to now move on to uh, our, our next topic, um, which clearly we are now in the challenges uh, of the packet recommendations for procurement teams. And you know how do we avoid a race uh, to the bottom? John, do you, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, certainly. Yeah, um, I think the the um, the challenges to the procurement team are the same challenges that procurement teams uh, have in this in the housing sector, and that is to um, persuade their business that um, that pr procurement is not about price. It's about value for money um, and everything that goes into that. So I, I think it will be supportive of procurement. I think the recommendations that will come out, um, which have come out, but I think there are further more specific procurement recommendations that will come out, will be, will, will be about value for money. And it'll be about value for money. It'll be about collaboration. Um, it'll be about around uh, you know sharing risk. And I think these are, you know, any good procurement person will recognise them as, as good procurement practice. So if nothing, you know, if nothing, it will provide more leverage for that approach um, within the rest of the organisation. My, my challenge will be particularly around certain directorates that uh, have traditionally had a very much a price focus. So uh, and, and, I, I, think, you, I think it will support us. Yeah. And, and, and do you believe, uh, John, uh, it, it may be a, a, a tricky question, but that you're starting to win that battle if, if, if that's if that's the if that's the right word are are yes, your colleagues think, taking more notice of i think we are and i think i think um it's when when procurement teams move from being sort of transactional uh, process driven uh, um, teams to uh, strategic teams that they that they that comes more to the fore and um and, and you know, developing evaluation criteria that focus on 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 quality um, that uh, reduces the impact of of um, on the price is 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 being picked up now and recognised. I mean, you know, the, our guys have all got a, a you know a view on value for money, and it varies sometimes, but generally the value for money approach is, is coming through more and more to the fore now. So um, yes, I'm, I'm 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 pleased with progress. Okay, um, uh, Nick, from from your perspective. Yeah, I think one of the, the main challenges really is to have the agility within procurement teams to, to firstly be able and then willing to to adapt to change and certainly implementing some of the, the changes that John has just touched on there. Public procurement, I think, as, as we all know, in general terms, has historically been seen as quite a risk averse industry. At least that's what research says anyway. And, you know, whether that's, that's true or not, but as we move forward to to implement recommendations from the Hacking Report, for me, procurement strategies will now need to adapt, and the need for agility probably highlighted even even further, given the challenges that that we're facing at the moment. But th this whole race to the bottom I mean, can definitely be mitigated by the strength of those strategies. I, I don't think it's as simple as saying, "Well, we need to provide more of a weighting towards quality than we will to price." It, it's taken that to another level to say, "Well, you know, how are those commercial models then going to be structured? 
having people with the right expertise to establish them in the first place to make sure that they're relevant to the works and consider things like whole life costs, but then how they're actually evaluated to, to ensure that costs are sustainable because ultimately there's two main outcomes if that isn't done correctly. Firstly, the work isn't done properly, which has a whole host of, of ramifications which, which we've seen. Well, secondly, the cost simply would be recovered somewhere else through that contract delivery. Uh, Rebecca? Um, I wholeheartedly agree with what um, uh, Nick said. I think what's going to come out of um, Hackett is uh, there's not going to be any legislation setting out any procurement requirements. I think it will all be done through guidance. And if people um, direct themselves towards the raising the bar, um, a consultation paper issued um, by the industry steering groups last October, you'll see Working Group H um, set out um, a, a procure, uh, well, a competency framework for the procurement leads, which I would commend to anybody that's looking at procuring high rise residential buildings. But it is likely that the Hackett agenda will um, expand and there's good um, practice um, outlined in there. I think I, I think the biggest procurement challenge for our sector being housing and construction, it is that whole life costing conundrum. Um, Hackett recommends that we adopt that as an approach, but when you drill down into the detail, it seems that the industry just isn't equipped with the data to support procurement leads adopting a whole life approach. And I think um, although the procurement rules have allowed us to evaluate on that basis for several years now, we just don't have the, the, the data um, or, or the kind of tools available to us to be able to do that on a widespread basis. So I think that there's a, a, a lot that kind of the procurement sector can can do to try and um, identify the blockers for the adoption of whole life costing and take that forward. Um, but I agree with what Nick says on the multi-criteria discipline um, decision making. Um, it, it's not about the weighting. So when clients say, oh yeah, we're not doing lowest price because we're doing 60% quality, 40% weighting, depending on how you evaluate your price, that could still be the determinative factor. So as a sector, we need to move away from weightings and look at methodologies um, that sit beneath it to make sure that we understand the impact of that tension between quality and price. John, just, just, just on that point, and also the, the point on a uh, whole life approach, again, is that something that you're starting to uh, adopt? Uh, well, uh, bo both things really. I think I agree with both Nick and Rebecca on this. I think the the whole life costing piece is is you know where do you start and how do you how do you really uh, assess the the value when you haven't got data to start with. But I think we're we're beginning to take a view that well we've got to start somewhere. So let's start and incorporate um, those approaches into our uh, procurement activities. Um, while I suppose the the data that we need is being collated and has been imp improved, um, so that is um, uh, it is it is difficult, but 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 hey, -ho, that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, in terms of the evaluation side of things, yeah, we're looking at. I mean, we're we're due to launch a, a large property procurement exercise, um, and we've re we're revisiting it again now to reflect on. Um, how we ensure that we, you know, we don't, we, we're not the, the the waiting, the waiting doesn't skew the result that we want uh, in terms of price. So, uh, and I know Rebecca and, uh, and and Co have done a huge amount of work on this. So uh, that's that's well worth having a look at. And and do do you have uh, you know any examples of, of where you've taken perhaps a, a more balanced approach to uh, the, the that sort of quality cost? Um, example in, in sort of recent procurement. John John first. Um, well in terms of preparing documentation for this property services uh, piece of work that we're doing, we, we you know we certainly have. Um, and um, 
we've looked at different pricing models to try and under to try and assess which is going to give us the the most cost effective um, result. We've looked at um, everything from uh, quality and performance, social value. Um, as part of the overarching assessment as well. So I don't think there's, I'm really saying much that isn't going on in a number of uh, housing organisations at the moment. I think we're we're all, you know, trying to find a path through it. Um, I think some of the less traditional areas, um, we, we IT being an example, which, um, we, we know, we've tended to use this approach for, uh, for a bit longer probably. Um, but yeah, it's coming. It's coming across all our procurements now, and it's it just it is working work in progress. Frankly, I can't. If you said to me, "Can you name a particular procurement you've done?" I don't think I can particularly. I think it, yeah. we've got a lot coming up, and that's we're going to incorporate all this thinking into those. Oh, okay. I'm sure um, some of your some of your um, some of your some of your guests may may have better examples than I can offer at this stage. Okay. Yeah. Then and again. Uh, just just a reminder to the audience if, if you do have any uh, question or, um, or or a comment or or, or examples uh, that, that you want to share please do use the question uh, box accordingly so just just, just finally uh, R rebecca or or nick anything further to add on that before we move on to the next topic rebecca first um nothing that springs to mind at the moment okay thanks and nick no, I mean, just just very briefly to touch on, um, to try, as you said, to try and give that balance. And we, we've looked at different ways we could perhaps level the playing field through sort of a world criteria and our approach to procurement over the last year or so. And to try and take the the quality ele element to a more of a, an evidence-based approach to create some some opportunities to to SMEs and to increase the level of competition there. And, and also sort of looking at the costs, as I mentioned before, to Firstly, how we actually establish them, how we then actually evaluate them using methods such as standard deviation to identify where perhaps costs don't sit right. Then engaging with bidders to to understand some of those those cost models and trying to get some evidence where we feel costs aren't sustainable of of where they've delivered those elsewhere. So I think it's just trying to think of perhaps some of the pinch points in in, in different areas across both quality and cost that will allow you to look at sort of what may be needed in terms of implementing improvements okay thanks so before uh, coronavirus we were all um, clearly uh, fixated by brexit but now we've left uh, the eu um it will probably come back at some point in in the future so what's what's the panel uh, believe is, is the future of, of, of procurement uh, rebecca do you, do you, would you like to go first um, sure. Well, I'm sure everybody's seen the kind of newspaper resort, um, reports about Boris's bonfire of the regulation and the fact that Dominic Cummings doesn't think much of procurement. So I think we, we've got to have a dose of reality and understand that that is the environment that we're working in. Um, speaking to the Cabinet Office, I think the general trend will be that procurement rules will be um, amended, replaced quite quickly following uh, the end of the withdrawal agreement. And I think um, the direction of travel is going to be towards less regulation and more soft law or guidance. And I think that as procurement specialists, we're gonna to have to get our head around that and um, get used to looking more at guidance and regulations. Um, I also think that there's um, um, a, a kind of move towards looking at a procurement tribunal for procurement based disputes, which should be cheaper and quicker than going to the high court each time a contractor wants to challenge, which is inevitably going to mean more challenges, um, but should be dealt with uh, quicker uh, and easier. and I think um, when we've spoken to them, we've asked them to look at procurement tribunals in other European countries because some work very well and some don't. Um, so um, I think procurement will be a fast changing area post um, uh, when we can uh, look at the acquis, but um, I don't think it's going to 
be gotten rid of in its entirety. I think cabinet office are well placed to understand cause and effect so that um, so hopefully some of the part four amendments array around getting rid of uh, selection questionnaires for the low threshold contracts, etc., uh, was dealing with the right problem, but maybe in the wrong way. So I think that they will be looking at that and very um, cognizant of some good ideas moving forward. Okay, just in terms of picking up that, that bit on uh, tribunals and making it, you know, potentially making it easier for there to be um challenges and, and therefore more challenges is that likely to then mean that we have to allow more time in the procurement process for increased challenges or are you hoping that the examples in other parts of of, of the world will sort of ease through that i think it really depends on what the challenge is made i mean for example at the moment we don't get um many challenges um before the award decision most people challenge because they think that the award decision was wrong or something fishy went on that they didn't get the contract for um we don't get many challenges on the fact that um you know uh, the, the tender document has been incorrectly drafted or there's something in there that's unfair or prejudicial uh, you're right. I think that um, it, it will depend on what the procurement tribunal is set up for, whether it is simply award decisions or, or whether there are, are quick procedures that can be adopted that effectively put a standstill on a tender procedure whilst the tender document um, is corrected or, or, or challenged. So I think it will be one of those um, things where um we will have to live it to learn it um but but potentially um it, it could be um something that adds more time w one thing we suggested to the um uh to, to the cabinet office is looking at something like a procurement ombudsman or something similar to the advocate general whereby you could go and get a preliminary ru ruling up front if you're unsure of anything that your approach to the tender documents or a particular clause or anything is okay and that you're safe to proceed okay J john so from, lots of different oh, ideas <laughs> flowing yeah. around. okay john from your perspective well um i'm not as as well connected um as rebecca is on, on this matter but I'll, I'll give you my my view is i'm quite interested in some of the comments that that were made with, with in relation to uh, the balance of policy versus statutory regulations uh, and if that that comes to fruition that that is um, I think quite a challenge for, for, for procurement teams in the public sector um, I think we've always had whether we like it or not this backstop of compliance uh, and therefore we we've, we've although we're pushing we've always pushed for value for money we've always pushed for the commercial contribution and that um, procurement can add a lot of exec teams still have in the back of their mind that we're, that we're, we're here as a compliance function um, and, unless of course they've, they've worked in other sectors in which case they, they know the value of procurement so I think that could be a slight risk if if we're not careful but it's a great opportunity to respond and to create a different environment now um, I know we all, we're, we all try and be enabling and we all try and do our bit to balance the statutory requirements with with, with making you know proactive positive quick decisions uh, and and maybe the, the slight sh change of emphasis will allow us to put more of it more of a focus on that um i think the other thing with brexit of course is uh, which we haven't touched on yet is is the uh, is the implications of the of the of the markets and, and how they're going to um, impact on procurement and uh, you know i'm thinking in particular around you know the labor markets um for construction and property services um contractors and and we're just going to have to see how that goes I, I think I think we're at the moment we're it has been put on the back burner but it will come to the fore when things settle down yeah absolutely um Nick from your perspective yeah it's it's an interesting one to keep an eye on in terms of the the tribunal piece and, uh, and the impact that that will then have around increasing challenges I mean you know absolutely nothing 
to hide in terms of our, our Fusion 21 procurement activity. I think in general terms, the, the, the concern is that there's a knock-on effect that, ha that that has on risk appetite and across across the sector, really, and ultimately the, the value for money that's achieved on the back of that. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, ultimately, for me, there, there will still be a requirement for competition and transparency in how we spend public money, and absolutely, the, you know, there should be, as well as how we ensure fair opportunity across our supply chain. So those treaty principles that underpin public procurement now will still apply. And I'm aware that the government set up a, a procurement task force to, to look at some of this. Uh, and whether there will be drastic reform, I, I guess we will, will will remain to be seen. And, and Rebecca's certainly closer to, to this than I am. But I would sense maybe a shift in, in how we operate in procurement to not just focus on procurement activity itself, but providing a greater focus towards supply chain management, which actually could be seen as a real opportunity for us in, in procurement and, and showing our worth, you know, similar to what John was mentioning on, on that first question. So the, the Brexit journey so far, it's, it's definitely presented a number of challenges in terms of the stability of the economy, how this then affects supply chains, how this affects costs, the potential access to skills and to labour, uh, and one way to effectively manage some of those challenges is, is how we do work with our supply chain and the relationships that we have with our suppliers, perhaps better understanding the market from the view of the supplier as well. Okay, we, we, we've got we've got a, a couple of a couple of questions uh, from, from from Lydia uh, Stockdale. Do, do you do you think there will be more freedom uh, for procurement professionals, perhaps? Uh, Taking up John's point in terms of uh, less less reliance on on compliance and and as a result, will that lead to more effective procurement decisions? Um, John, do, do you want to answer that first? Um, well, I, as I said, I, I'm only picking up what Rebecca was was in, was indicating when she answered the question originally. But if the answer is um, um, is as she's laid out, then I would think yes to both. Really, I think it's a, it's. A, it'll give us more flexibility and it will allow us to you know to to, to, to focus on different things so uh, um i would see it as a i would see it's a very positive step um clearly it probably it won't happen all in one go and it may be it grow over a period of time but uh, it it should allow us to um you know to, to look at the the other value streams that procurement can add and i know we'll probably talk about supply uh, uh, management in a bit but uh, all that type of thing can, can come to the fore yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rebecca, any, anything finally to add? Yeah, I think in terms of freedom and flexibility, um, I always uh, query what that means. I mean, in terms of being able to just go off and do your own thing, probably not, because all of the future procurement rules will be underpinned by WTO GPA, of which we will be a member, well, we are a member now. So, it will all go back to WTO rules and, and need to be compliant with that. So in terms of transparency, fairness, equal treatment, non-discrimination, as, as Nick says, that, that will still be there. I, I think the direction of travel is twofold. One, uh, the Cabinet Office are really keen to see procurement as an enabler and they are very well aware that people tend to gold plate procurement um, and, and act in a very risk averse manner. So I think their overall thrust is to, to make sure that people use procurement in a flexible, result orientated, solution orientated manner and not just to follow you know uh what they think the rules say quite blindly um so what john picked up about that value for money etc is still it, it will be you know the aim of the resulting procurement regime um and i think just just in terms of um regulations i think they will slim down but the guidance issued will be soft law so in terms of level of regulation um and enforceability that won't change it will just take a different mode yeah okay yeah no, no absolutely um just a reminder to the audience please do feel free to uh, ask any questions or make 
uh, any comments you have you use the um, question uh, bar on 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 the right hand side um moving then on uh, in terms of again a number of you have, have mentioned uh, the the importance of relationship with suppliers particularly in these uh, difficult times but, but how do we work with suppliers to uh, improve relations and and to prioritize uh, quality in terms of the procurement john would you would you like to go first yes happy to yeah um I think from um, from MTVH's perspective, I think I suggest people turn it on its head, really, and, and say, how do suppliers want to work with um, with us in the housing sector? And they will quite clearly have differentiated um, their customers into importance and, and, and criticality for their business. So from from a metropolitan Thames Valley perspective, we're implementing a supply relationship contract management approach, which um, has allowed us to assess the criticality of all, all our suppliers um, and create um, scenarios or, or, or let's say relationship scenarios for different levels of criticality. <clears throat> um, the criticality um, that we've looked at um, are things like impact on the customer, <coughs> financial impact, uh, any regulatory or legal um, uh, issues, etc. So there are about seven different criticality factors, and we've assessed them all. Now, what that allows us then to do is to uh, to categorise our suppliers to allow us to focus on the ones that um, are really important to us, um, and to make sure then that with those suppliers and those groups of suppliers. We understand the types of um, contract management, behavioural management that we want to see in place. Now, um, I think it's fair to say in uh, in my background in, in housing, in two organisations, I think a lot of the relationships have traditionally been, say, adversarial, but a little bit adversarial, um, particularly uh, with contractors. And, uh, and clearly, that is doesn't get the best out, out of the contractors. So a combination of the work that we're doing and the support that we're likely to get out of the Hackett recommendations means that we're going to be working more collaboratively with those critically important suppliers. Um, at the moment, we've we've uh, we've we've had we've, we've designed that we've, we've designed the approach, we've designed the structure, we've had it reviewed by by KPMG. They've tweaked it here and tweaked it there for us, and we are in the process subject to where we are today uh, of rolling that out across across the business with the appointment of a supply relationship manager so it's um it's a big opportunity for us to change the way we engage with our suppliers and the and the value that we we get from those suppliers because of that change equally we're fully aware as well that um, suppliers are going to have to uh, work with us to see us change our behaviors and, and, and they'll have to respond appropriately as well if they, if we're both going to get parity in terms of value okay that's what we're doing um, at MPH. okay great uh nick yeah well first of all john it sounds really really positive um, in, in terms of what you're doing there and it certainly would love to to learn from some of that experience at some point um but also if uh, as rebecca mentioned the, the government aim is for procurement to become this enabler then i, I feel that srm should certainly be at the heart of that uh, at Fusion 21, we, we've been making some positive steps to develop how we, we work with our suppliers. We've got over 400 suppliers across our procurement frameworks, and we, we are shifting to start to recognise or increasingly recognise the contributions that, that those suppliers have within our industry. And I think for us, it's been recognising that it's, it's not just about how suppliers compete for our business anymore and compete for a place in our frameworks we're actually competing for those suppliers now and we want to prioritize quality in the delivery of works and, and services then we need to make sure that our frameworks are full of the best suppliers that exist in those markets and I guess for us there's a couple of things that we can do to to achieve that first of all we we engage with the supply chain from from the outset of the procurement strategy and get them involved in shaping that that service and having some ownership of that which for me is crucial and then secondly helping shape the procurement from their perspective as well and as i touched on earlier around um, trying to level the playing field avoiding that procurement competition that's faced towards those who could potentially
potentially provide the best subjective essay responses to a procurement to, to actually level in that playing field and providing opportunities for, for SMEs because ultimately the, the greater level of competition we get, the greater opportunity there is to, to deliver good quality services through those contracts. Okay, um, Rebecca, do you have a... Um, obviously not, um, you know, from, from clients. I think the, the, the success of a, a relationship between supplier and client, um, and I sound rather like a broken drum, I think is all created at the procurement stage. And if you have bid on a basis or, or tendered on a basis where contractors are incentivized to kind of fictionalize their offering both in terms of quality and the price that they're going to charge you uh, you've already started off the relationship um, on the wrong footing and it's surprising even on actual cost contracts that are set up for our clients how contractors step away from that relationship because they're not being paid enough of their overheads and profits so I think that as procurement teams we've got a huge responsibility to make sure that what we procure is sustainable going forward into the contract management stage because we also know with um you know especially construction contracts we're not paying for clerk's work to be on site all the time we're not paying for that quality audit going through the life of the contract you know we're, not, we're doing 10 percent post inspections if that and i think that we need to kind of ensure that um, you know procurement helps the contract managers out in a sense that um, they need to, to, to make that link uh, between the tender offering and what's delivered on site. Okay we, we've got a, got a question from Beverly Elaine who um, again picks up a, I think a very important thing which is as, as public bodies how do we ensure that social value is, is prioritised given significant prominence and given significant prominence when supply chains are being disrupted and potentially uh, changed forever by, by coronavirus. Again, I, I think it, 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 that's an important point. Uh, John, do, do you want to see how, how you think we should still be delivering social value? Um, to be honest, I hadn't even thought about social value through the coronavirus uh, aspects because, because of the limitations on, on uh, on working together with our customers. Uh, I think in terms of social value going forward, I don't think anything changes. I think we, you know, we're incorporating social value uh, into our agreements. We have a community investment team that are tracking um, the outputs of the, uh, well, tracking what value we have committed, as contractors have committed to in their agreements uh, and uh, ensuring that that is um, maintained and distributed effectively. Um, in terms of um, delivering that social value at the moment, I think that's um, that's more of a challenge. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't think much I, has changed. I think I think it's yeah. still you know crucially important, and, and it's part of everything we do. So, I, I know from a, a phone call I had earlier this morning with uh, an internal phone call with a colleague at Fusion Twenty One who's responsible for delivering social value is that we want to have a sort of a discussion with our members around you know how it how it how it how it might change, you know. For example, if a, if a contract was uh, about to be delivered in terms of an apprentice, but that might may or may not be possible given the current circumstances, could social value be delivered by contractors, staff volunteering, or you know, delivering parcels or delivering um, you know food parcels and so on to, uh, to to tenants and so on. So again. I know from a Fusion 21 perspective, we're, we're trying to see how, in the current environment, uh, the social value offer uh, might change. Um, and again, happy to yeah, share some further thoughts uh, with, with with Beverly um, offline. So so great. Um, We've got an, a, another question from Adrian Moody. Is, is social value what used to be sustainable uh, procurement in the in the noughties? Again, I don't know if anybody wants to uh, wants to add, uh, 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 respond to that. Yeah, I'm happy to speak that one, Andrea. I think I think it's a fair point because yes, we're we're certainly in in challenging times right now, and it's positive to hear some of the steps that that are being made to sort of revisit what we do, but also 
I think we should recognise all of the, you know, the good work that has gone on over the years across supply chains and by, you know, public organisations in terms of having that that positive social impact. I think for 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 me moving forward, my, my advice would be to for any organisation, public body, to you know, engage with suppliers in, in terms of what suppliers could perhaps deliver uh, to meet the, the sort of economic drivers that individual organisations have. And we've we've taken steps of Fusion 21 over the last year or so to try and create a more or a more flexible model of procurement, uh, of social values through procurement, and you know, appreciating that it's not as simple as us stating obligations and embedding those within contracts to say, you know, you, you must create one opportunity, one job opportunity or trading opportunity, whatever it may be, for a certain level of spend, but appreciating that there does need to be some more flexibility in terms of how some of those obligations are are embedded in those contracts. But I think creating some engagement between organisations and the suppliers is, is a way of agreeing what can be delivered through that delivery plan and then perhaps building that back into the contract. Okay, Rebecca, have you anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I suppose uh, to answer Adrian's question, you know, in name only, really, I mean, it's much more sophisticated now. And I think that back in the noughties, we used to have contractors sort of saying to us, well, are you telling me if I don't give you an apprentice, you're going to terminate my contract or levy some sort of penalty? And at that time, I think the industry was a lot more cautious about sort of saying, well, well, yes, I think the agenda's elevated up to, you know, much greater importance within the overall procurement piece. You know, the regulations have now made it crystal clear, if it wasn't in the 2004 directive, that you can take into account social value. Um, and uh, and I think that it is much more, as, as Nick says, much more of an organic agenda, that yes, you can have contractual obligations, um, uh, but but also there is that flexibility uh, where contractors and clients are much more um, uh, kind of willing and able to have um, that that kind of ongoing conversation about community investment and impact. I mean, the only thing I would say is that all too often we don't see the social value agenda being priced separately at procurement stage, and I think my view is is that it should be. Because if, as a client, you're asked ambitious output, then there has to be an acknowledgement that that is an overhead the contract will have to um, spend. And so much more the better to see it and separate it out to, it, to ensure that, A, they are taking it seriously, they have priced it, so that they are expecting to deliver it. Um, but, but also couple that with your contract management um, kind of processes so you can see what they are delivering or what their new ideas are as well. So I think it's become much more front and centre than it was in the noughties where, where there was still a question mark as to whether we should be procuring it um, and evaluating it at all. Okay, yeah, but yeah, but very, uh, yeah very interesting. Okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, move on move on to our uh, next uh, subject which, which is around uh, involving uh, residents in uh, asset and, 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 and procurement uh, procurement strategies um, Nick what, what from a fusion 21 uh, perspective I know that we're about to embark on some work uh, with 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 TPAS, but what's your sort of general view on on the involvement of, uh, of, of residents particularly in the development of uh, asset and procurement strategies? Yeah, so we, we talked on a few occasions already around the importance of suppliers being involved in shaping and procurement strategies and I guess the same principles apply to involving you know, customers or residents within that. I guess their, their input into asset strategies will be key to ensuring that those plans reflect their needs and, and this could be to, to input on how work is staged or structured, perhaps asking them for ideas of innovative methods of delivering work or the types of, of technologies perhaps that could be used within properties which could ultimately improve quality of life for them as well as delivering the aims of the landlord as well. So I think a lot of opportunity in, in that space, uh, early engagement is, is critical for that and creating some opportunities for engagement might be 
through you know various workshops, meet the buyer type events, you know, but ultimately perhaps having that time to take that feedback back and really think about how that can affect both the asset and the procurement strategies and you know the time often within you know what we do and procurement is 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 of the essence and I think having the time to to, to really take that and, and and build it in and add that value to it is is critical because ultimately it could lead to more ownership from residents in in the delivery of work which you know, could then improve overall resident satisfaction as well. Um, R Rebecca, from 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 your perspective. I, mean, I absolutely 100% agree with what Nick said. I mean, what strikes me is what's come out of the Grenfell inquiry and the phrase that's often used is um, that the, the residents there saying nothing about us without us. And I feel that that's kind of, you know, if we are doing something that um, pr uh, procuring a contract that has a direct impact on residents' life. And as Nick said, the en early engagement about framing the specification, understanding need of, um, of the residents is just key. Um, you know, that we've been involved in residents for years and I sometimes feel that, um, you know, we often um, include them to provide lip service to it. So I've seen plenty of residents on, on interview panels um, and site visits where they haven't been properly briefed and they don't completely understand what their role is in that evaluation so um, early engagement training um, uh, um, it, it is going to be key and I know that Fusion 21 are going to do a really good piece of work with TPAS on this so um, really looking forward to seeing the outcome of that because I think that that will provide some really useful practical tips of, of how to include residents at all stages of procurement in a way that as Nick says, increases value for money and and kind of the the relevance of the outcomes of the procurement as it goes on to site. Yeah, that, 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 that's really interesting. And, and yes, we, we would um, you know, really like to um, you know engage with, with, with our members and and if they do uh, have any examples of, of best practice in this area, then please do share that with us. So again, uh, any of the this morning's attendees, if, if, if you in your organisation have any examples of, of, of good practice, uh, please uh, please do send it uh, through uh, to us. John, from a, a metropolitan Thames Valley uh, position in terms of the involvement of, of residents in, in, in asset and procurement strategies. Uh, sorry, everybody, I, I dipped out there for a minute. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I, I think this is an area. Uh, I think this is an area where we need to Im improve what we do um, from a metropolitan Thames Valley perspective. I don't think we we do it well. Um, I would be very keen to take any learnings from any of your uh, members and from any group that you set up, uh, Andrew, to to see how you do it. Um, since we we're, since the merger between Thames Valley Housing and, and Metropolitan, we're we're in the process of reorganising our engagement generally with our customer base, um, different customer forums, regional customer forums, etc. Uh, and that is um, where we hope to see a significant improvement in the way we, we engage from a procurement perspective. Uh, I've got no pearls of wisdom. I don't just don't think we do it very well. And I'm hoping that the, the new structures that we're putting in place at Metropolitan Thames Valley will allow us to facilitate greater involvement with residents. Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, Nick, any, anything further to add uh, on that from your perspective? Not on, on that point, Andrew, and okay. sort of reiterating what I've said there, yeah. Okay, right, great. Let's, um, uh, let's, let, let's move on. Uh, clearly, you know, one of the other major uh, issues is around, you know, saving uh, the planet and the zero carbon agenda, albeit that somebody has said, and I think uh, newspapers are, are reporting it you know, quite a bit of how uh, pollution has uh, and, and uh, CO2 has reduced dramatically uh, as a result of uh, the coronavirus. But anyway, uh, assuming that we do get back uh, to normal, how do procurement teams respond uh, to the zero carbon uh, agenda? Uh, Rebecca. Oh, there's so much to say about this. Um, so with net zero we're we're finding um a lot of challenges where 
people are still trying to go out to new technologies on a capex basis because a lot of the net zero products are frankly because they're emerging technologies subject to lots of r d um more expensive um so just to do a kind of lowest price equals highest marks on capex for net zero products is causing problems because actually the way we procure still favors tried and tested traditional methods um, and products so i think uh, one we've got to look at our, our kind of pricing um practice and this is where whole life crossing would come into its own um secondly a anticipate um kind of car uh, carbon neutral or of net zero solutions um or migrating to them across the contract in the tender document and allow a specific review procedure in the contract so that you can you know have something to pin any future change on especially if you're entering into a long-term partnering arrangement that is for you know five to ten years what you want to do is make sure that you can incorporate emerging technologies in them without having to come back to the lawyers and ask whether it's allowed or not under regulation 72 I think there's two starters there. Okay, John. Uh, yeah, I think as Rebecca said, there is, there is a lot to talk about. We, we're we're taking a, uh, well. Our focus at the moment is less about um, specific procurements, uh, whether it's capex, opex, etc. It's more of an organisational thing and a governance approach. So, you know, from this is an opportunity that we are taking, and maybe it's fortunate that I have a category manager who's also qualified in energy and sustainability. So we are taking the lead from a central services perspective to coordinate the businesses, the whole business, its approach to uh, the, zero, the zero carbon agenda. So we've got teams in property services who are developing their, uh, their own strategies. We've got development colleagues that are developing those, but the rest of the business needs to be coordinated and, and procurement are taking the lead with that. Uh, for that within MTVH. So uh, one of my category managers who looks after corporate services is picking this this activity up uh, and that is um, we're, we're, we're developing a plan as we speak, we're looking at metrics, we're looking at benchmarking, we're looking at improvement plans and that, that will impact on everything the business does, not just the way we go to the market for particular um, uh, products or services. So we're coming from it from a from a uh, an overarching um, organizational perspective and then it'll feed down into how we procure but at this stage you know we're still procuring uh, energy uh, reduction related products and services but we're taking more of a holistic view of it across the business okay uh, nick yeah i think the first point for me is that you know procurement strategy should certainly always consider government policy i think there's a big responsibility on us as procurement professionals to support the delivery of that government policy and, and the government agenda through through public spend and whether that's having a, a positive social impact through procurement that we've talked about or delivering some of the SME targets to, to, to now obviously supporting this zero carbon and yeah 2050 seems like a long way away but you know our opportunity perhaps is to start supporting the delivery of the agenda now and you know some of the, the tips that, that John and Rebecca have just provided I think for us Frameworks are generally in place for four years, but it's not about us saying, well, you know, we don't really need to worry because we've got another eight generation frameworks before we get there or, or need to worry about it. There will naturally be a transition and it, it will be a step change in, in how we continue to approach zero carbon. As an example, within our new heat and renewables framework, we, we created a bespoke supply chain to deliver renewable only works as well as also allowing the delivery of those renewable technologies alongside some of the more traditional heating systems. So through some of the early engagement stuff that we did, it was quite evident there were, there were two separate supply chains in how that could be delivered. And you know, we appreciated that it was important that we got the flexibility to deliver both options. So I think for us, responding to zero carbon agenda is perhaps about us being in, in, in touch with what's happening at government level, thinking about how we can then influence that through procurement having the flexibility to deliver it and, and then actually think about how our current frameworks and contracts can provide a platform for that future change. 
Okay, that's um, that, that that's great. Okay, um, we're we're nearly uh, at the end of uh, what is now this afternoon's uh, webinar. I've had uh, one one further question from uh, Kamal Hussein. I think he's uh, onward home. Uh, what 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 measures uh, are proposed to be taken to ensure contractors are providing competitive market value rates rather than keeping it competitive within the tenderers consortium i'm not sure i fully understand uh, the question but but nick do do, do you um do you understand uh, well if, if i'll well i'll have a go at interpreting it and and, uh, <laughs> and i'll give a view but um yeah it, it's obviously costs initially provided up front and and, and then there is a, a responsibility on how we manage those costs and you know things things do change the generally would be provisions within a contract to, to effectively manage cost during a, a contract term but you know again as we've seen through through brexit has been such and of course what's happening now has been such a significant impact on the economy that has placed a greater focus around cost management type activity so you know, for us we we go through a continuous process of, of engaging with our suppliers managing relationships uh, understanding some sort of market factors understanding the costs that make up our works or, or some of our products and um, being in touch with you know market rate changes exchange rate changes price of petrol etc to, to give us a view that when we do have those types of cost conversations with our suppliers that were quite well informed in in terms of, of how we do that so um I, I think it's an important role for anybody within procurement once contracts are established to, to keep on top of those cost changes I hope I've interpreted that correctly. Excellent. Okay, so um, I've got one final um, question, which which is uh, again from, uh, from 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 Lydia, and and perhaps um, it hopefully it won't uh, trip the panel up. Um, but uh, as as a sort of final parting shot, can the panelists leave us with one positive uh, thing that to think about in relation to the future of procurement? Um, let me pick on uh, Rebecca, you you first. So let, let, let's finish this this webinar on some you know, really positive thoughts for the future. Um, job security. <laughs> and with all these agendas coming into the sector, we've got Decent Home 2, we've got Net Zero Carbon, we've got Hackett. So much cost is coming into the, the sector that procurement specialists and professionals are going to be at the front line to ensure that we achieve a value for money fit for purpose solution that doesn't all fall apart when it goes onto site. So I feel that um, we are in the midst of a kind of upskilling uh, professionalization drive of the procurement industry and um, we're all at the forefront of that. So in terms of a positive message, I think that um, at Touchwood will all be in a job for many years to come. Okay, thank you. John? Um, well, what, what can I say? I think that uh, procurement is, with one or two exceptions uh, as of today, is, is the most exciting profession to be in. Um, and the reason I say that is it, it allows you to impact on every part of the business. So, you know, we, we've got stake, every part of uh, all the stakeholders, everybody that, 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 that works for us, who's uh, who are our customers are, are all impacted by the work that we do um, and we can make our customers lives better we can make the business more efficient and provide um, improvements to the customers lives as a result of what we do we you know we're in terms of stakeholder engagement we're across the whole piece um, we've got huge you know benchmarking opportunities with other sectors to see how they do it so the learning opportunity is never ending um, whether that's in housing or public sector, private sector, you know, all across the world. So uh, I think it's a great profession to be in, reiterating everything that um, Re Rebecca said as well, which is that there are, you know, you know that they'll be pulling on us. They'll want that the businesses will be pulling us. They'll they'll need the cost savings, uh, you know, to going forward. We'll ne they'll need us to implement the Hackett recommendation. It'll be more of a pull going forward, forward than, a, than a push, I would suggest. But uh, there we are. Excellent. Uh, Nick? Yeah, I think there's obviously a lot for us to be doing moving forward. I think also there's, there's a big opportunity in this interim period because 
you know, naturally things are going to, to ramp up again in, in, in terms of sort of contract activity. I think there's a, there's a big opportunity for us to sort of review some of that activity in the, in the interim, maybe look at some continuous in, improvement opportunities so that when everything does start to, to, to ramp up again, we're in even more of a, a strong position as a profession than, than we've been to date. So I, I, I sense a lot of opportunity and can only reiterate what, what John and Rebecca have said as well. Okay, that's uh, that, that's fantastic and a, and a, and a, and a good positive uh, note uh, to end. So I, I just want to uh, wrap up uh, by um, thanking um, the panel on on our audience's behalf. So a virtual uh, round of applause uh, from me and all the and all the attendees. I, I want to thank you, our audience, for listening. Hopefully, um, you all uh, enjoyed it. We will be sending out some feedback, so if you could uh, complete the questionnaire, that would be great. We are hopefully going to run some more of these type uh, events, and again, your feedback uh, into it uh, whilst we're all working from home um, will be very, very grateful. So again, thank you to the panel. Thank you for you uh, for listening. Uh, stay safe, uh, and let's meet again. Uh, in this virtual world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.